It's truly a gift to have this show here under any circumstances, and not to mention a global pandemic that nobody planned for, and to be transported to New York in a moment when it's not available to us, um, and when so many of us yearn for the stimulation and pleasures of travel, this is really, really meaningful indeed. Um, <clears throat> and since, since we're going to spend three Saturdays together, I just wanted to give a little further nuance to um, my own biography. And there's a reason for this, which has nothing to do with egotism. I'm not an egotist, but anyway. Uh, I know some of you already, and for those of you who don't, I'm sure you can tell from my accent that I'm not local. I grew up in Canada, the daughter of Czech immigrants, and studied art history at Queen's University in Kingston, a city between Toronto and Montreal. <clears throat> I worked really hard for traveling scholarships that enabled my studies to include various locations abroad, such as Prague, Berlin, and Venice. And after a year of teaching at the University of Guelph, which is another city in Canada, uh, a job ad for a university called UQ caught my eye uh, in a place I have to admit I knew little about at the time, Brisbane. I had to look it up, actually. I didn't really uh, know much about um, cities apart from Sydney and Melbourne and Australia at that time. So, wanted Renaissance and Baroque specialist. Uh, I applied, landed the job, moved to Australia, and I've been at UQ ever since. And that was 12 years ago. I am sharing these details with you, not from any sense of egotism, but rather because I've been thinking about how immigration and globalism matter to this exhibition and to what we're about to embark upon together. I never imagined when I started my studies that I would make my career in Australia, but I'm very glad that I did. International perspectives, global imaginings, and cross-cultural possibilities are exactly what universities and art galleries can and should enable. And I'm very proud to be part of an art history department that teaches Australian, Indigenous, and Pacific, veers from modernisms to the global contemporary as much as Renaissance and Baroque. Being a part of this diversity impacts how we view the so-called canon of art history and enables us to change it and think it through very carefully. Similarly, it's brilliant that Quagoma as an institution can bring us, without paradox, shows such as this present glorious Met show of old masters, and then in a few months' time, the shining contemporary beacon that is the APT. We can and must be open to multiple geographies and temporalities, allow ourselves to travel not only to other places, but times as well. So ideas of global citizenship and social responsibility have never pressed upon us so much as now, and it, art and its history can bring so much to the debate and discussion. That is why I choose to mention that I'm a Czech, Canadian, and now Australian. Uh, my patchwork identity fosters my approach to thinking and writing about art. And because, you know, when art is at its most vital, it enables those cross-cultural dialogues. It fosters empathy, understanding, sustains criticism, and vibrant thinking. I'll say more about geographies in our third session, which is called The Power of Place. Um, but just as a preamble to all of these sessions, however you engage with these paintings, it is really worth remembering that before they became part of the New York collection, they had lives elsewhere. So they're immigrants too, removed from their original contexts in Germany, France, Italy, Spain, the Netherlands. When faced with a very diverse show like this, basic questions arise. What counts as Europe? What is Western art? How does Australia relate to these constructs? And global approaches to art history are increasingly the norm, but within this framework, we should not neglect nuance. We must be careful before saying simply there is such a thing as European painting. We need to unpack that a little bit. That's what I'd like to do here. With, um, and another preliminary remark, you know, in preparation for these sessions, I've been thinking a lot about this term, masterpieces. You know, what counts as that, what does not? And with present day moves to decolonize the art history curriculum, I think it's vital that while we add in, we do not simply subtract as well. Decolonizing does not mean diminishing or ignoring these great works. And I use that term great purposefully and with care, but re-examining the stories they can tell us. So it's time, and this gives us the opportunity to take a fresh look 
um, to consider not only what is left out of the canon, but to look anew at what is already there. So it's a wonderful opportunity for this. We have five centuries of painting, united by being European, and their present day status as immigrants in New York who are visiting Brisbane. This is how I've been thinking about them. And here they are, this group on tour, you know, eager to share their stories. Um, this show is really challenging one to encompass in three lectures. I could do 10 or 20, uh, really, really could. Um, and it's broadly curated. There's this inherent flexibility and so many different themes one could tease out that differ from the three that I have chosen. You know, when you go again, imagine what themes resonate for you. Overall, um, these 65 paintings, they are bursting with ideas. They are not old relics or diminished by time. So let's forget for a moment that contemporary art drives the art market. I don't want to think about the art market today. I just want to think about the paintings and, and pay attention to these old masters, just as other artists do. Um, my favorite art historian, Abby Varberg, talks about the lives of images. They are not stagnant. They evolve. They acquire layers of meaning. That is true of these works as well. And I couldn't be happier to be welcoming Michael Zavros later to to engage in this discussion, to get his thoughts on these paintings, because as a practicing artist, he has as much to say as I do as an art historian. Plus, I just really enjoy talking to Michael. So I'm really, really happy that we're gonna do that session. So thank you, Michael, for being here, and I'm really looking forward to our chat. Okay, let's get some art up. <laughs> um, so today's session is called From Flesh to Fashion and we'll address states of dress and undress in paintings. We're going to look at the genres of portraiture, um, religious and mythological narratives, okay? Um, and I, as I mentioned, I will focus especially on the first two sections of the exhibition, which have been named Devotion and Renaissance and Absolutism and Enlightenment. And these zones of the exhibition cover roughly the 15th to the 18th centuries. So please, you know, it's, it's challenging to whip through <laughs> four centuries. Um, and that, uh, you know, as an art historian, I'm constantly thinking, well, what am I leaving out here? But I will, you know, attempt a kind of, in, involved in the session on flesh to fashion is also roughly a kind of chronological ordering here um, for reasons that will become apparent. We could start by saying that human presence or you know, figurative painting is the overwhelming focus in these sections and in what I'm going to talk about today, obviously. We could start by observing that human presence peters off in the last section of the show when we reach an end point with Monet's water lilies. So if you've noticed that there are fewer humans around in the last section of the show, a veritable shift towards landscape and still life, that would be a very astute observation and indeed broadly reflective of the history of painting. For the earlier periods, it wouldn't really occur to an artist to paint a scene without human presence. Narrative was the driving force for art, the idea of telling human stories necessarily involving humans. And I will say more about this next week when we look at the lives of things, because in that session, we're gonna pivot in a different way. We're gonna think about how the, the things within the paintings are animating um, various aspects of stories, but also the focus on the things in and of themselves is an important story to tell about European painting in this period, okay? So some of the paintings will come back again next week in a different way, with a different lens. So why should we care about what these people are wearing? The question of what to wear or what not to wear is a terrific lens with which to consider our visitors. Artists made decisions about how to present individuals, religious saints, and mythological figures. They would draw upon past examples and traditions in line with those, and sometimes as a subversion of cultural norms. So sometimes when an artist decides to do something a little bit differently, we, we art historians sort of notice that and pick up on, oh yeah, a deviation from um, tradition, and that's always exciting to um, observe. It may seem to occur at a snail pace in this period, but um, that's you know, where the interest um, really comes in. As I'll show today, clothing is never neutral in these paintings. Garments and draperies come loaded with associations. They give us clues about our subjects, about emotions. They carry emotions in narratives. 
Um, I, there's a terrific art historian who writes about drapery as agent of feeling. You know, the idea of cloth as carrier of emotion, that's something I want to explore with you today. Um, and also, clothing tells us a lot about shifts in iconography and social histories. But most importantly, well, maybe not most, I mean, it's all important, but the decision to show states of undress, right, or a figure fully nude, that carries enormous connotations as well that we need to think about today, okay? So it's all about people today. Who is our who? Sounds like a Dr. Seuss. <laughs> so who is our who? Um, and the reason I have that question here in my notes is because I also want to start start this, you know, um, another preamble here is thinking about who our artists are, okay? And there has been some talk about this Met show as a very male-dominated one, okay? And I want to address that a little bit. Yes, it is true there are only two women artists included, the extraordinary portraits by uh, Elizabeth Vigée Lebrun and Marie-Denise Villiers, which I think are rightfully two of sort of the, the shining lights in the show that a lot of people have been talking about. More on those to come. They, they kind of clue up the session today. But let's think about this, because in our focus today on the 15th and the 18th centuries, while it be true to say that there were fewer women artists, it would also be true to say that those that did gain access to training have been woefully understudied. This is a truth. This is a truth of my um, discipline in the area. Um, Giorgio Vasari, who I think many of you will have heard of. I'm seeing lots of nods and knowledgeable um, responses there. So in his Lives of the Artists, which is basically this, um, for those of you who don't know, um, text in which the lives of the artists are treated with as much seriousness of purpose as politicians or religious figures. Artists are sort of on the scene as vibrant, extraordinary individuals who change and impact history and they matter in that period. And Giorgio Vasari writes this, Lives of the Artists. Biography becomes a lens through which we think about art history. Anyway, in that book, so there's about 200 artists, and four of them are women. So right there, you see a kind of neglect happening, because there were more practicing women artists than that. So it's a very vibrant, um, never let anyone tell you there's nothing to do, and I'm saying this partially to my students who are here, that there's nothing to do with early modern art anymore that's all sort of finished. No, there is much that remains to be discerned around um, women artists in the period, and it's absolutely being redressed in current art histories and scholarship. So some named Sofonispa uh, Angulosola in, from Milan, Lavinia Fontana, Katrina van Hemesen, those are some of the big name um, artists that you'll hear more of in the coming years, I'm sure, as they become a more central part of the canon of art history. And the Baroque period fares a bit better in this regard. We, there are a lot more named individual um, women artists in that period. So I'm thinking, and you've probably, many of you have heard of Artemisia Gentileschi, of course, who um, had her first uh, solo show at the National Gallery in London where they purchased a new work, they acquired a new work by her. And so it's 2020 and it's the first time she's getting a solo show and then COVID <laughs> hit and no one got to go. It was very frustrating because everyone was excited about this. It was Artemisia's moment to shine and then COVID strikes and that show in the end, not a lot of people got to go and see it. I mention all that, you know, and, and just to say, you know, the National Gallery in London, I mean, 2% of their collection is by women artists. So if you, if you stop and think about that, it, it's, it's worrying. But anyway, so these, these artists, you know, they made their careers in portraiture and created some of the most astonishing self-portraits of the period. And like, that's another lecture for another time, but I want to pause and give Vasari credit for his laudatory descriptions of the women he did include. So take, for example, Sofonispa Angusola. He says, the portraits achieved by her hand are worthy to be praised by all. He also says, women have achieved excellence in every art they have given care to. So <clears throat> anyway, there's more to be discerned around all of this. Coming back to our Met show, what I want to say about that is like the dearth of authorship by women should not detract from our interest in the early modern period or this show or be seen as some flaw. 
in art history, authorship is not the only thing that matters. Um, some important numbers here. So in the Met Show, of the 65 works across five centuries, 37 of those feature or include women as subjects, playing integral roles in the composition. And 31 feature men as subjects in the same capacities. Now, <clears throat> we, in fact, have an excellent opportunity in the show to focus on the lives of women and to consider how they were featured, their lives, their customs, their dress, especially if we embrace this kind of social history of art lens that fashion allows us to do. So it is a particular lens that we're bringing in this session um, to thinking about these works. Okay, finally, you know, 15 minutes in, I'm gonna to start to talk about some paintings. <laughs> okay. Um, <clears throat> so I want to start our session with these two, these are humble, simple portraits, okay? These are not, this is not royalty on display, this is not a king or queen or some noble figure. These are humble, simple portraits. I love them, okay? I think these are really terrific, smaller works in the show that are a little bit overlooked, you know, when you've got a Caravaggio down the hall and a Rembrandt, and et cetera. So part of my task today is to uh, share with you why I think these, these works are special and worth your time and a really close look, again, um, when, I, when you go back to um, the show. We'll start by saying that portraiture really is a hallmark of this period we call the Renaissance, or as it's often called, the early modern period. You'll hear that term used as well, which is that, of course, much, much debated um, historical moment when thinking of individuals as engines of history took hold, artists' lives, such as in the Vasari lives I just mentioned, um, were starting to be seen as as important forces, as, as important as politicians or religious figures. The term Renaissance suggests that kinship with and even rebirth of antiquity. But there is more to it than this. There's more to consider than that rebirth. I'm gonna read a little quote to you from a very well-known art historian, John Paoletti. He says, art mattered in the Renaissance. Viewers expected works of art to be meaningful purposeful and functional, not just beautiful. Visual imagery was so important, and the physical manufacture of works of art so complicated that artists rarely worked alone. They collaborated with one another and with a wide range of patrons, responding sensitively to the differing civic, social, political, and historical contexts in which they worked. Art mattered because it was the product of an entire society. It both forged and reflected societal values. I love this quote. I feel like it could be a guiding force for this show because it opens up to everything that we must think about, not just authorship, you know, or the rise of individual and famous artists, not just a move from the sacred to the secular. Patronage, collaboration, contracts, materials, methods, Renovations, restorations, new genres emerging, philosophies, art as the lifeblood of society. And I, I believe that. I, I wouldn't be an art historian if I didn't. There's no money in my gig. So it's, it's like, you know, very much art as this lifeblood of society. I believe that in, in what I study. I believe that in, you know, my engagement with um, contemporary artists, I, I, my curating, everything. So that's just something since we're gonna meet for the next three Saturdays, that's something else you can know about me in this context. Um, so art in the period went, uh, this is another comment to make. I know it seems like there's a lot of preambles, but that's just for this session. We, we are gonna dig deep. Um, art in the period went far beyond paintings. Multimedia is not just the arena of the contemporary. Only a small percentage of visual culture from the period survives. Ephemeral things mattered. So, Banners, parade materials, sculpture, and so on, jewelry, all of these items, that counted in that context as works of art that mattered um, to society and were vibrant expressions thereof. We kind of have to wait until about the 19th century for the modernist emphasis on painting as a primary vehicle of artistic expression. So that's just something important for you to understand about this earlier context, okay? So here, 
are two contemporary and rather humble individuals, very much presented as themselves, not idealized, not made out to be grandiose. Portraits played vital roles in 15th century Italy and the Netherlands, which are the two cultures we see represented here. They were valued as collectible objects, mementos for after death, status symbols, and played important roles in devotional acts and social settings. They were very precious to their owners and collectors. On the left, presenting a public, you know, a suitable face for marriage. You know, the likelihood of this being a sort of betrothal portrait has been much um, investigated. Or on the right, with the anonymous um, man, that work was likely included within a larger altarpiece scene. Um, possibly the figure was a donor, so the one who paid for the altarpiece. I mean, those are two different motivations that can be unpacked here. These aren't just sort of you know, they're, they're, the motivations are run deeper than, you know, here's a selfie of me or a picture of me. We have to think about the seriousness with which these um, works would have been created. Just to dig a little more with the Davide um, Ghirlandaio painting, um, this, you know, simple portrait, um, this is an artist, in fact, who we know a lot more about his brother than him, uh, his brother Domenico whose oeuvre is far more secure and well-known. Um, he was famous for teaching the even more famous Michelangelo. That's Davide's brother, Domenico. So, in fact, catalog entries, when it comes to this work, will often say more about the brother of the artist than the artist, because we just don't know very much about him. He does come up in Vasari's lives, but as a kind of, not sideshow, but sort of, you know, as part of... Um, Domenico's larger story. So, a mi you know, a minor artist, really. Um, and the sitter, not the firstborn, but the fifth of seven, seven daughters. So, um, you know, <laughs> we're talking in terms of painter and sitter, this is absolutely a humble and quiet work. But as ever, the kinds of questions you ask matter. Um, as I said, you know, I checked in with Vasari here just to see how Davide comes up. And it's really interesting because he's always Domenico's brother. He finished up a few paintings for Domenico. He, you know, he was always present. He um, took care of the household affairs when Domenico was busy. You know, this kind of thing. He's sort of this almost subsidiary to a larger um, story. Um, and the, I mean, I just have to read this because it speaks to uh, the um, sense of elevation artists are starting to feel for themselves in this period. Because Vasari talks about how Domenico and Davide are um, finishing up a commission and they're working at, a, um, at Santa Maria Nova, Nuova in Florence, completing up some work. They come, they're supposed to have dinner prepared for them by the, the members of the um, confraternity. I'm just gonna read this directly to you because I think it's hilarious. Um, they come to dinner only to find a board, this is a direct quote from Vasari, only to find a board covered with bowls and messes, only fit for a hangman, therefore like beneath them, exactly the same as before. Thereupon Davide, flying into rage, upset the soup over the fryer and seizing the loaf that was on the table, fell upon him with it, like he's beating him with a loaf of bread, okay? Um, and belabored him in such a manner that he was carried away to his cell more dead than alive. So all of this over like a badly prepared dinner, okay? Anyway, Vasari is great. If I could, I should have added that to the list of things to read. Just read Vasari. Nothing opens up more to this period than the glorious storytelling of Vasari. So highly recommend it. Anyway, back to the story. The abbot, who was already in bed, got up and ran to the noise, believing that the monastery was tumbling down. And finding the friar in a sorry plight, he began to upbraid Davide. Enraged by this, Davide bade him be gone out of his sight, saying that the talent of Domenico was worth more than all the pigs of abbots like him that had ever lived in that monastery. Whereupon the abbot, seeing himself in the wrong, did his utmost from that time onwards to treat them like the important men that they were. So even with this, like, Literally, I can't emphasize this enough, Domin Domenico gets a whole massive entry in the lives. Davide is like bits and pieces within that. He finished up the painting, he helped him with this, he, he solved household problems, he dumped, he tacked an abba with a loaf of bread. But my point is, 
even in that, that is like Davide, we, you know, in art history, sort of more traditional art history, it's like, who are the big artists, the big, with this minor artist, we get that colorful storytelling and we understand that even with him, it was essential he be um, treated with respect and validated as an artist. So this is a little bit of an aside to our focus on fashion, but it's just to say that is part of the context we're dealing with here. Artists, you know, on a more elevated platform. And that is a big story, part of the story of the Renaissance art. Okay, but what about the fashion? So it will, be, it will also do well to note that their name, Ghirlandaio, okay, was adopted because of their dad, Tommaso, who actually was the one, according to Vasari, who invented and put into execution ornaments that would be worn on the head um, of the women of Florence. Ghirlandaio, gar like the kind of garland. And he made tons of them. He had a workshop that produced them. And that speaks to what I said earlier. It is not just about paintings. That was a viable and important aspect of the culture of the time. And that is why, you know, what does that tell us? Attention to, to women being paid, women's customs, women's garments, um, attention to ornament as an art form. Um, now, the catalog description for this painting is lovely. It says, you know, she wears a tight-fitting, green, watered silk bodice, laced with black over white chemise, a small veil over her shoulders, and a cap on the back of her head. It's a beautiful description. I can't improve that. So that's why I read it verbatim. In other words, though, this is a contemporary Florentine woman in a dress and a commemorative painting likely designed to mark her betrothal. And rightfully, so in the Quagoma blog, they've, they've drawn a lot of attention to the necklace there. It's beautiful. A jeweler in Brisbane wrote about it. It's, it's absolutely lovely. And I think that is rightfully where this seemingly minor portrait opens up to just this array of thinking just by focusing on that necklace, OK? This necklace of large coral beads and a pendant set with pearls, colored stones, Simple yet sophisticated. This is very different from the kind of um, elaborate chains of gold, silver, and pearls that you'd see more upper class individuals draped in. Um, we have to think about the making of those kinds of um, necklaces. The fact these are craftsmen creating, polishing the, the stones, the corals, etc. They're not factory produced. They are a labor of love and artistic endeavors in their own right. Um, we can go further. Like, we can get a lot out of this necklace, I'm telling you. We can go further. Coral necklaces are special. You know, during the early modern period, coral was often given to children as a protective charm. And this could be in the form of beads or carved amulets. And it's also been noted that coral was sometimes used for teething. So one jeweler described it as hard but yielding. Um, and some corals will be kept from... Um, kept by the owner from childhood onward and could be adapted or restrung for later life, thereby becoming a precious heirloom. The age of our sitter here, she's about to get married, you know, that, that to me is a telling passage, thinking about coral as something you have when you're young and then you have it as you get older and you just adapt it to, um, you know, what you need it to be as an adult. That's fascinating. The materiality of that is absolutely fascinating. Materiality is important. Um, what things are made of matters. Um, and apart from all of this, I mean, coral is fascinating to me because I have a, uh, a lot of, of research and interest in um, the cabinets of curiosities and the Kunstkammern of the period, which are these sort of wild collections where it's like the antithesis of a hang in a contemporary gallery where, you know, in a contemporary gallery, you have the spacing and every, in a Kunstkammer or cabinet of curiosities, you know, jewels next to rocks, next to paintings, next to, so a very different form of display. And coral mattered a lot to these displays, which were really attempts to show in microcosm the world at large. And coral, uh, you know, with its uh, possibilities, you know, it's something that, um, um, you know, it was considered a living organism, grows beneath the ocean, was seen as a preserver of life, a protector, a healer. It had connotations for the resurrection as well with its blood red color signifying um, the blood of Christ, all of these things. So coral 
matters. It's really important to thinking through the context of this period. One more thing I'll say about it. Um, you know, there's another side to consider here with trade and colonialism. Because during the early modern period, corals from the Mediterranean were diffused by European merchants and various parts into various parts of the world. They are a medium of various kinds of exchange with Africa and Asia. So, the, you know, Mediterranean red coral was at the center of major circuits of trade. That's a really important aspect of our early modern period as well. These, you know, pathways of globalism that I talked about at the very beginning, you know, you're trying to use me as an example or the paintings, like movement of, of things, that early modern period is like proto-globalization. There are those movements and circuits happening. So the coral necklace here, when we look at it, it opens up to that. We don't get that if we just look at this and who is it by and are they well-known artists? No, we need, we're using that social lens, that social history of art, we can pick up on and answer very different questions. Clothing matters. The, the necklace is signifying something very important about the sitter, but also about the period from which the work stems. All that from a simple necklace. Um, <clears throat> trust me, I have a lot more slides. I, I move faster, but I just felt like with these first two, I just want to set up a couple of things that we can draw upon in, in what follows. So in thinking about what things are made of, and this idea of from flesh to fashion, and fashion, because um, clothing, according to one theorist who I'll now quote, touches on every issue, raw materials, production processes, manufacturing costs, cultural stability, social hierarchy. We can get a lot with this lens. Um, looking at the context here, we could further reflect upon the fact that, you know, the Italian city-states, such as, you know, most preeminently Florence, are this kind of a birthplace of a certain kind of fashion as much as, um, you know, the flourishing of Renaissance art. And with the rise of cities, a middle class, a broader cultural Renaissance, the demise of feudalism, um, the emergence of a new merchant class, international trade, all of those things are simmering here and could be impact in the context of a portrait like this. Now, as for dressing this portrait, Ghirlandaio is working in that Italian context where he's working, and this is where I want to say labels are your friends. They aren't just there to, for copyright purposes. They, they matter because they give us incredibly valuable information. This is tempera on wood, okay? This is before the adoption of oil as the medium of choice by painters. And that is a crucial component of the story of the history of, of European painting that I want to talk about a little bit more now. Because Ghirlandaio, working with tempera on wood, all of this before oil paint burst on the scene, for our next portrait by Hugo van der Goes, a different materiality is in play, OK? That is oil on wood. There is a difference. If you go into the show and look again, you will see that difference. So let me say a little bit about um, our next artist, Hugo van der Goes. Very briefly, just that he is very important and among the most significant Flemish painters of the fifth, late 15th century. Um, but again, works ascribed to him are very rare. And there are quite a few copies that do document his um, impact on Flemish art, ideas including like new color spectrums, um, the fostering of oils as a technique, and a highly individualistic um, manner of portraying figures and facial expressions. So we're talking about naturalism and oils, and this matters to our story. He was born in Ghent around 1440, and he was the deacon of a painter's guild there several times. He had a lot of great patrons. We know quite a bit about Hugo van der Goes. Um, from the Dutch Vasari, Karl van Munder, so someone who analogously to Vasari decides to write a history of northern um, artists. And at the high point of his career, this is quite sad actually, Hugo van der Goes um, closed himself up, closed his studio, sank into a bit of a depression, and it's documented that he attempted to take his own life. Um, so we do have a significant amount of biographical detail there. What do we know about our sitter? Nothing, <laughs> nothing, comparatively little. Um, indeed, nothing at all. 
but it doesn't matter. There's still things to unpack here. We know that this work has been cut down from a larger composition. It is not in its original form. It would have been part of a larger scene, like a diptych, so two-part altarpiece. Um, and the man is likely a donor or someone who financed the work. With hands clasped in prayer, that's our biggest clue to this as a devotional image. Um, and the dress is very modest. But ask the right question and you can learn so much. Forget identity. This humble painting is telling us something incredibly important. Look at the hard modeling in the face. Look at the play of shadows, the chiaroscuro, so the contrast between light and dark, all playing out over these deep set eyes. The, the fingernails are a little bit dirty. Um, there's a five o'clock shadow. Is, is that an expression? <laughs> you know, when you have that bit of scruff, right? You haven't shaved. We have that happening there. Um, nothing is idealized. This is a frank and honest portrait and the details are astonishing. Why am I excited? It's executed in oil and oil is enabling that. That sense of detail, the glazes, the sheen, the different kinds of um, possibilities there. And comparing tempera to oil, um, thinking about how artists dressed their paintings, um, by that I mean the very application of paint, so clothing the panel, so to speak and the emergence of oil painting as a technique and later canvas as a support is one of the most important things we can observe in this show. That is absolutely fabulous. Look at the Guerland diet. Just if you compare and contrast the two, art historians love compare and contrast. The, you know, with the Guerland diet, you've got a bit more of a flatter application of paint, fewer tonal differences. There's less depth in the color. Contrast that with the Hugo van der Goss. And that is not to diminish this work. It's just to say that from a technical perspective, thinking about the, the paint, we do see nuances and differences. More so in person, which is why it's so great this show is here, because you know it's, it's one thing to say it about a slide, but another to see it for yourself. The Hugo van der Goss has that more nuanced approach to skin tones and shadows. It looks less like a cutout and more like a flesh and bones figure. The cheekbones, the Adam's apple, the pronounced and emphatic that, you know, the painter is articulating bone structure and what lies beneath as much as anything. So this dialogue says is an important aspect of how ideas circulated, how, and putting these particular works into dialogue makes sense because when paintings by Hugo van der Goss arrived in Florence, so trade is happening, there's different patrons, donors, pictures are on the move. When those early Flemish paintings arrived in Florence, the Florentine painters are like, whoa, they're blown away because they're seeing the possibilities and capabilities of a paint other than what they've been used to using since the 14th, 13th century. And different, very different from fresco as well. So what oil paint allows and enables, that is a kind of cross-cultural, exciting dialogue happening that we can imagine with just putting these two humble pictures together. Okay, look, I'm gonna, put some new art up. <laughs> I promise next time to go a little faster because I'm looking at my clock and I'm getting a bit horrified. Um, look at this sequence, okay? So this is, this, you know, my art history students here who've done my Renaissance course, they'll, they'll know I love doing a sequence like this. You know, I, I once had a prof who was like, why well, study Renaissance art? One Madonna, two Madonna, another Madonna. It's just over and over again, Madonna, Madonna. No. You look at this and you can learn so, so very much from a sequence, a simple sequence like this. Once you have that difference in mind and are thinking about oils and tempera and the differences and different support, et cetera, you, it opens up a kind of whole new perspective on things. You understand that much of what was happening in Italy differed from what was happening in the Netherlands and that much innovation in the Renaissance is a result of a heady and multicultural mix of ideas. Treat those labels as your friends and you start to see things a little bit differently. Thinking about dimensions, you know, how big something is, um, can imply a lot about the setting for which it was intended, for example. Um, so in the first section of the exhibition, Devotion Renaissance, we have five tempera on panel paintings, seven oil on panel, and four oil on canvas. That is the kind of progression of things, okay? Because then in the next sessions, we're gonna talk a lot about um, later works and oil on canvas is gonna be a big thing. That is the preferred uh, support and medium for our painters um, through to the 19th century, okay? It emerges as the, it takes over, it becomes the medium of choice. Um, 
And it's just basically, if I can make one suggestion to you, and Michael and I will talk about this a little later, it's to pay attention to what things are made of. Tempera paint is very different from oil. Tempera on panel differs from oil on canvas. Um, so <laughs> let's get back to clothing as well. Um, and I'm happy to share with you um, um, sort of resources on that. On, like, I have a thing here, and I'm just going to shift it and move on, because the resource around understanding the materiality of paint is, I think, crucial um, to understanding elements of this show. Um, basically, thinking that oil paint as it develops in the Netherlands involves painting with pigments that use, you know, you use different kinds of oils as binding agents. You have different oils, different results, different drying times. You can do glazes, have sheens, um, make adjustments as you go along. Tempera, harder to fix, harder to change, harder to make adjustments, harder to have those nuances and different senses of layering. Okay. Now, this row of Madonna allows us to see a few things. You know, it is one of the most iconic and um, painted, um, you know, uh, uh, subject matters in the history of art for this period, in the, in the history of painting for this period. But again, it allows us to think about this contrast between Italian and Netherlandish approaches, differences between tempera and oil, a rise in a kind of naturalism that the North also embraces, the burgeoning interest in nature, you know, I think you can see, see all this for yourself. Shifting ideas about how to present one of the most sacred figures and iconographies of the Catholic Church, the Madonna and Child. We can also chart a difference here between works intended for more public versus private consumption in accordance with how these Madonnas are dressed and presented. So fairly quickly, just moving from left to right, I mean, with the Fra Filippo Lippi, this is a majestic presentation. It's the, the type we call the Maesta. The Virgin is enthroned with the Christ child. It's got a seriousness of purpose with that sort of Old Testament scroll coming from the back, from the angel's hand in the back. This is a ponderous, serious image, otherworldly, you know, devotion, you know, etc. Moving to Carlo Crivelli, and this is a work we're definitely talking about next week because we need to talk about the cucumber and the fly and all this, the things, okay? That's absolutely, I think, I'm gonna put that in my top three in the show because it is a fabulous work. Um, but thinking about it in this sequence here, we see a very Venetian work. The Venetians loved color and um, vibrant patterns from elsewhere. We see that in the Madonna's cloak. Um, we see an emergence of a kind of naturalistic background there, and that's Venice's place in the north. There's a lot of um, Flemish works coming directly to there, even before they get to Florence. Um, and then, you know, the, um, what else could we say here? We still have that sense of being enthroned, but with a difference, right? There's a nuance between that and the more traditional approach of Fra Filippo Lippi, which involves this architectural construct. Here in the Crivelli, the Virgin is neither inside nor outside. It's this kind of liminal, ambiguous, strange space, which is absolutely fascinating. So more on that one next week. But then over to our Netherlandish works on the far right. Absolutely, that placement of the Virgin there completely in nature. That, that is the kind of Flemish propensity, the interest in um, uh, nature as a setting. The, the plants can all be differentiated. They're looking, they're examining, they're thinking about what's around them. Um, and the oil on wood, you know, if you look at that work in the show, you see that. And then finally on the far right, the Derek Bouts, I mean, in a, a session on From Flesh to Fashion, you could not have a more modestly dressed version than that one there. And, you know, comparing that back to the first two. And that's one of the works Michael and I looked at last week, thinking about the glazes and thinking about the approach to paint and how luminous and shiny it is, which it looks different from how it's a bit washed up on this slide, but so definitely worth your time. But overwhelmingly for me, that work is about this bond between mother and child that is so realistic, so, um, you know, sensually depicted and very different from our, it's not to say one is better than the other. That's not what I'm saying. It's not a value judgment. It's more about the intentions, the, the desires, the artistic decisions are different. This serves a different purpose from the one on the far right, which is tiny, very small work for private devotion. And very much about saying the virgin and child are like you and I. There's no big halo there. There's no you know, sense of the divine as you have with the Crivelli or the Lippi. And you, you kind of see that in that shift over there. It's just literally just a kind of 
devotional image, simple, the bond, right? Okay. And there's a great, I think Quagoma blog just did a piece on the ultramarine and the virgin's cloak, which is really well done. So have a listen to that as well um, for the Gerard David. Okay. Look, I'm going to put up another image. <laughs> I'm going to move a bit more quickly. Um, wow. Okay. So, I mean, like I said, could do 20 lectures, but let's consider another iconic moment in the Christian faith, so the lamentation. So this moment when, you know, Christ is taken down from the cross, he's surrounded by um, mourners. Um, this opens up, this painting opens us up now to states of dress and undress in paintings. When do we see nudes? <laughs> when are the nudes coming, Andrea? Well, they, it, there is a kind of um, a rule of thumb. You know, often in paintings, the least dressed is reserved for some of the highest up in the um, Christian hierarchy. So I'm thinking Christ. I'm thinking Adam and Eve. They are often shown as nudes. Um, and saints such as Saint Sebastian. So this is different from the mythological works we'll look at soon, which, you know, with mythology, it's almost as if the classicism gives license for nudity that was not permitted elsewhere in um, more Christian iconography. But I love this painting as well. It is a work of contrasts between flesh and cloth, and it also shows emphatic and pronounced emotional resonances. Petrus Christus, he's one of the most... Um, He's a very well-known and meticulous oil painter. He worked in miniatures and manuscript um, illumination as well. We know about 30 works by his hand. And he's very well-known for his portraits. So you could do a session where you looked at the, the dress in those paintings as well. This format is kind of unusual for him. He's usually doing portraits, much as the ones we looked at a bit earlier. Um, probably for a confraternity. So devotion, again, on a, a bit of a smaller scale. Apart from Christ's body in and of itself, we see various clues scattered. So the instruments of the passion there on the right, we see Mary Magdalene with her ointment jar. Um, St. John is supporting Christ's mother Mary as she swoons into a faint. Now, thinking about fashion, dress, costume, ordinary people are part of this Netherlandish realism and naturalism. All are in contemporary dress. The clothes enabled contemporary viewers to be part of a scene. And the compassion evoked and echoed. I mean, look at the attention to detail as well here. The blood running down Christ's leg. His anatomy is pronounced. The curves and swoops of the drapery. So the curve of Christ is echoed by the curve of his mother who's mourning his death. Um, you know, all of this is made possible. This kind of, what I said earlier, it, drapery is agents of feeling. The activation of the cloth there. Um, you know, the, that swooping white cloth, which our eye just you know, launches onto painters making decisions about how to draw our eye and attention to particular zones of a work of art. And that happens not only with things like perspective, which is a very developed um, practice in, in Italy in particular, but it also happens with color. And the, the way that um, zones, as I said, zones of interest get created. And here it's very much that um, Christ and the drapery in the foreground Okay, now something different. So <laughs> moving on to states of undress, you know, I've just given you this rule of thumb around, you know, when you see nudity in um, religious scenes, it's often Christ, Eve, uh, Saint Sebastian. Well, with mythology, it's a whole other ball game. And artists can really revel in their explorations of flesh and thinking about anatomy and exploring how to show, the, and as you all know, um, the nude carries through as a point of interest for artists well into the 19th century um, and you know, features prominently at the end of our Met show um, with works by Courbet, for example, and um, uh, there's one other, anyway, I'll get to it later. But the point being, it, it eventually is gonna become part of an act artist's training to be able to show a nude convincingly. Now, in a way, it's, you know, again, I have my point of contrast around my different cultures that are mixing and interacting and happening in this period. Um, you know, again, what we have to do here is think about um, uh, the classical and antique, sorcer uh, antique sources available to our artists in this period. We have that cultural contrast. We have the German artist, Lucas Cronach, the Elder, on the left, and the Venetian artist, Titian, on the right. Now, it's not a great comparison if you look at our nudes. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm faulting myself, but it's, it's a little bit unfair. Um, Chronics are very abstracted. I'm sure you can all see that. 
um, while Titians are full and rounded and more real. This in itself, this in and of itself is another observation we can make, you know, how access to antiquity, mythology, prohibitions against um, looking at models in the nude would have been in place in the German lands in this period. So their access to antiquity and those kinds of sources is a bit different. Our Italian artists uh, get to work with nudes a little earlier than our German artists, so that is a point of difference to um, establish here. Another simple rule of thumb, like nine times out of 10 when you have a nude female, it's gonna be a mythological work, okay? Eve is that kind of exception to that rule. Um, the stories here are, are colorful and wonderful, you know, um, you know, with the, the judgment of Paris, we have a story known from Homer's Iliad, so Hera, Athena, and Aphrodite are in a beauty contest, and they appear before Paris, Prince of Troy, and Paris picks Aphrodite, who promises him Helen of Troy as his wife, and he then abducts her and starts the Trojan War. Um, so Kronach loved depicting this scene. He did about a dozen variations, as did other artists. And looking at Cronach's mythological works, it can be hard to remember that they stem from the hand of a painter who is probably better known to you as one of the most important Reformation artists. So the very serious, ponderous themes of you know, the Reformation, working with Martin Luther, saying the church needs to change its ways. And so he painted a lot of almost like propaganda type pieces for that very important religious movement. And some scholars are like, what? The mythologies? How does that fit in? Cronach was a great businessman. He you know, painted what he needed to to get paid. And there was still a patronage for this kind of work, um, especially as the currents of the Italian Renaissance start to surge north a little bit with people like Albrecht Dürer and you know, their intersections and interactions with um, Cronach. Uh, you know, look at the creative, <laughs> creative interpretation of antique armor there in the, 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 you know, the figure of Paris. Like, so what I find fascinating about the Northern Renaissance is in fact this creative appropriation of and, and imagining of antiquity because they don't have access to it in the same way that the Italians do who are there on site in the zone um, watching the renovation and um, archeology span of Rome happening, all these new buildings coming up new sources, the statuary that's emerging. So Northern Renaissance is different from Italian for this very reason, around the access to antiquity. And this is a great way of thinking about that. Now, of course, the Titian, I mean, you know, the Titian can and should be a lecture in and of itself, really. It's, it's an amazing work. Um, and thinking about this as poesy, I mean, so painting as poetry, and Titian very much, you know, directly quoting and saying and referencing antiquity as a source of inspiration here, saying as is painting, so is poetry, that kind of competition inherited from antiquity, which is all about can painting succeed as well as poetry? Are words better than pictures? I think pictures, but anyway, I think that it's a really um, incredible moment as well to think of this in terms of patronage. He's got Philip II in Spain who is advocating for these works who, who Titian is creating them for. And so this to me is that shining example of it's not all pictures of Jesus and Mary in the Renaissance, which is what some people think when they approach this as a field of study, this overwhelming religiosity. Our Renaissance artists and patrons and um, you know the, the society at large had no trouble with that overt religiosity and then kind of the sensuality and secular qualities of something like the story of Venus and Adonis and that vivid portrayal of, of nudity. They, it wasn't fine. It wasn't a paradox. It was easy to reconcile. No problem, we do this, we do this. And you know, with Philip II as a patron, I mean, you have to imagine as well that those works went to very dogmatic and Catholic Spain and, you know, the public face in the Spanish court could sometimes be all about um, portraiture and um, very chaste images. And then they tuck away in their pleasure palaces all these sort of mythological um, works. So in context, a very interesting um, painting to think about in, in terms of, um, yeah, different motivations that are apparent. But, but in terms of this 
thinking through of flesh and fashion and nudity and how it matters. Mythology is that zone where artists get to explore flesh and think about anatomy. And of course, that is a really important component for artistic training of being able to show someone dressed. You need to be able to understand how the human form works in order to convincingly articulate um, a dressed figure as well. I would, I would argue that. So there's a reason, uh, there's a reason why um, the depiction of uh, the nude becomes a standard part of artistic training. Okay. We're in the green zone now. That's my signal that we've entered the 17th century and we need to shift our thinking a little bit. Um, because in the green zone, um, you know, with Caravaggio as a transition to the Baroque, and before I talk about specific works, I'd just like to give some really broad bullet points. Some useful context here is that we're thinking about the era of the Counter-Reformation. So when the church is responding to the Reformation of the North, and art is firmly called into the service of the church again. So Lucas Cronach, we just looked at, is a very important Reformation artist, and now we're shifting right into um, the response from Rome um, as the church is challenged from the north. Let's consider again what they're making. So that shift to oil on canvas I mentioned earlier is well represented here. In the second zone of the exhibition, there's only one oil on panel. And the rest, 29, I think, are oil on canvas. Okay, so that is an important point of difference. That speaks to that um, shift in terms of, you know, oil on canvas becomes the, the medium of choice. Oil on canvas becomes the reigning mode right through to the end. Well, the end of the show. <laughs> um, the broad geographies are beautifully represented in this section. So there are examples of Flemish, Italian, Spanish, Dutch, French. Every important center of Baroque art is represented in this Met show. All the key Baroque artists, the big five are here, Rubens, Rembrandt, Caravaggio, Poussin, Velasquez. So well done. <laughs> That's just a miracle, very impressive. Um, you know, and I've just spent all this time talking about how authorship isn't everything, and now I'm you know, saying how exciting it is. But it is, it is. They are masters, and it's amazing these works are here. Um, with the 17th century, with art making in the 17th century, patronage, the question of patronage is really crucial, and the kind of art being made could largely depend on who was commissioning it. So there are salient differences between the patronage of the Spanish court with its inquisition, stiff courtly etiquette, intense Catholicism, versus a place like the Dutch Republic, for example, where a rising middle class, the emergence of new genres, a more relaxed sense of social etiquette prevailed. So in this period, the map of Europe is being redrawn, and wars of religion are raging, um, debates of Catholic versus Protestant. So it is another heady mix of change, evolution, shifting power dynamics, and all of that can be read in the dress, in the fashion, in changing modes of um, self-presentation. In the midst of all of this as well, we have the emergence of new genres, still life, landscape, scenes of everyday life, more portraiture and self-portraiture. Um, in our show, we have five portraits, 11 genre scenes, three religious scenes, um, you know, for this section. Um, and the hierarchy of art, so what counted as a subject, that is changing and evolving in this period as well. Now, for genre scenes, so the portrayal of everyday individuals, I mean, you cannot do better than Caravaggio. So he really is this towering force in Baroque painting, trans certainly like a transition through to Baroque painting. Um, Travel matters to thinking about his oeuvre as well. He trained in Milan, was active in Rome, Naples, Malta, Sicily. A life lived with difficulties. Um, he died at 38 after a short career of only 15 years. If your way into art is through biography, he's a great choice because he has a very colorful, complex, police record driven <laughs> biography where it's, it, you know, I always say to my students, I'm like, we know a lot about Caravaggio because there's a lot of police records that we can link up to him, you know, for various um, crimes that he was, you know, punished for. He, he has to leave Rome because he's um, 
uh, you know, he's, he murdered, in fact, murders someone. Um, there's a famous instance where he's, he gets a jail sentence because he throws an artichoke at a waiter. It's just very strange things. His biography is very colorful and unique. And I, when I say that authorship isn't all that matters, of course I'm not saying the biographies aren't, this is a fabulous and very interesting um, biography. We know of about 50 works by his hand, no sketches at all. And the remarkable thing about Caravaggio is just this propensity to work straight onto the canvas. So in the Renaissance, there was a big you know, emphasis on disegno, or on the preparatory drawings you would do to create a work. Caravaggio's, nah, just not into that. He wants to work directly on the canvas. He wants to paint what he sees around him, the life he sees around him. Instead of doing a proper allegory of music, which would involve a female figure holding a guitar, he decides to take four individuals he knows and plop them in there, and he indicates it's an allegory by the antique dress in there. So again, the costume matters. It's its, it's indication here that this is has an antique connotation. Um, so, you know, that is sort of, the, the flesh in Caravaggio, I mean, you could, again, that could be an entire topic in and of itself, but he's very important for the show, also in terms of what he points the way towards. Caravaggio's works always involve this kind of pr pressing forward of like three quarter length um, individuals. No, it, like he couldn't give a hoot about background or perspective or landscape. This is all about people and what they're wearing, um, pressed forward with these kind of spotlight effects, we, you know, radical approach to chiaroscuro, and that gets picked up less in um, uh, Italy immediately and rather more so in places like France. There's a real interest in Caravaggio's work in, um, th there's a whole group called the Utrecht Caravaggisti, for example, who pick up on components of his style in the north, um, Simon Vouet, uh, Georges de Latour are brilliant examples of artists in France who are completely inspired by what Caravaggio has done. And um, fashion plays really crucial roles here. As I said, you know, with the Caravaggio work, you know, an indication of giving him permission in a way to engage in the sensualities of flesh there, because yeah, this is an allegory actually. This is, you know, it has that, that connotation. Therefore, I get to, to go there. Um, similarly, with women playing guitar, which could very well be an allegory for um, music as well, this voluptuous, you know, fully rounded, um, you know, vibrant woman, uh, you know, the same dramatic lighting and naturalism that we saw in the Caravaggio work, really um, coming through there. So Caravaggio is an inspired and inspiring example for that fo human focus. Really, as I said, I can't overemphasize, overemphasize enough how little background matters to Caravaggio. There, there's nothing, you know, if you want to talk about single point perspective, this is not your man, <laughs> or these are not your, your artists, because it's not about that at all. Um, so, vibrant dress, and I mean, the fortune teller rightfully has become a hero image for the whole show, and I love this painting, and the, the catalog description for it, I, I will read it to you um, because, again, I don't feel like I can improve on it. It says, the handsome youth is dressed in a buff jerkin combined with various embroidered garments, predominantly pink. There are gold knobs on his belts, gold ties at the neck of his shirt. His purse strings are gold and enamel, and a medallion on a long chain is inscribed with the Latin words for love and faith, virtues that are not present here. A tempting target. He is victimized by three thieves. I love that the thieves are women. Again, like this is this is just a terrific work. An elderly crone who takes his coin to tell his fortune. A young woman with pale skin and a sideways chain who cuts the chain of his medallion. And another who removes an object or two from his pocket. So the poor lad, you know, from all angles, there's there's thievery happening. And again, you know, those the darting eyes, which. Um, you know, but then in a session on flesh to fashion, I mean, the vibrancy of the costume there and, um, you know, the indication of um, multiculturalism at play in there is, is really um, beautiful. The patterning, I mean, um, there are, I have colleagues in art history who focus on cloth as, you know, and as an epitomizing cultural trade and the movement of 
things is linked with the movement of ideas. So that's, that's what makes these works especially exciting. I have seven minutes, okay. Um, very quickly, how will I wrap this up? I will. Um, what I'd like to quickly add in here, so this is very different from what we just looked at, that focus on contemporary life and, and street life and, um, you know, uh, thievery of, you know, happening in the um, Georges de Latour. Here, I just want to point out quickly, and this will help us for the weeks to come, you know, again, context matters. These Spanish works and the motivation of portraiture at the Spanish court is very, very radically different from what Caravaggio and his followers are engaged with. This is about the highest patronage possible, the patronage of the Spanish court, where rules matter, etiquette is all important, um, but they tuck away their mythologies on the side, as I said earlier. So like, that is that formal public presentation of um, you know, importance. Velasquez becomes the, uh, really the artist at court who the, um, Philip says, Philip Forth says, this is my painter. No one else will paint me ever again. He does my portrait. So he's ensured this incredible um, uh, patronage that never dries up. And he makes his bread and butter just portraits, 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 in addition to other masterworks like Las Meninas that, you know, and again, a lecture for another time because that paradox is quite, but anyway, here we see kind of typical examples of Spanish portraiture and many of you will remember the Prado exhibition that came and how, you know, intently we felt there like, whoa, the, the form, the rules around dress and presentation and self-presentation are so of such paramount importance within the context of the Spanish court. So with that eye, you can really draw a contrast between something like this and what Caravaggio is busy doing. Because Caravaggio, he's not getting the most elevated patrons. He starts out, he's getting um, you know, a job here, a job there. He finally does get some um, steady patronage from a particular patron in Rome. But really and truly throughout his oeuvre, it's just about, uh, I suppose, a humbler approach to um, the who of the paintings. Here, elevated, elevated, elevated. And I have these two works here to speak to exactly what I just said about contrasts at the Spanish, um, co you know, contrast in this period in terms of what you can and can't do. Um, so again, you know, a virgin child, it would be really instructive to sort of compare this back to the, the first sequence we looked at of, of Madonna and child. Um, and, you know, here, the, the bond with mother and child very vibrantly um, depicted. I actually had a student who wrote a whole, a very fascinating paper upon, on um, the virgin's breast and how that, the kind of emergence of the virgins, there are paintings where you see uh, partial breasts, sometimes where you see a fuller one, and that as part of a kind of rise in thinking through um, in terms of a naturalism. And here, the idea is the child has paused, you know, post um, having a feed. How different is that from the uh, portrayal of um, Cleopatra by our very fascinating painter, Cagnacci, who um, led a very uh, strange life. His works seem strikingly modern when you look at them now. He's a very unusual Baroque painter, and sensuality and um, eroticism are a huge part of, of his oeuvre. So this contrast just saying sacred and secular they can reconcile it, it's working. And the state of dress or undress in a painting is a huge indicator of that type of, that painterly motivation of what's going on. So good keys for you to, when you look at any kind of collection of old masters, um, and great ways to help you identify who, who a particular subject is, I really mean it. I mean, um, the snake, you know it's um, Cleopatra, you know it's the story from Petrarch, you know, those are become indicators of who we are looking at. Um, oh, three minutes. Um, <laughs> sorry, I might carry a couple of my last slides over to next week and just fit it, and then, anyway, we'll see. But I have this work from our collection here for a very important reason because, I mean, this, this under, 
studied, and this work deserves more attention and is worth, and it fits beautifully in our session because the idea of, of flesh and fashion, I mean, here, you know, young women, I always think of the Velvet Underground song Venus and Furs when I look at this, actually, if you know that song. Um, but this, absolutely, here we have Rubens um, copying a work by Titian. Now, don't let that word copy throw you off or go, oh, it's, it's not important. It is a really crucial um, point for understanding uh, a later work by Rubens where he depicts his own wife with a fur and in a similar state of undress. And uh, it speaks to, again, what clothing can tell us about where these works were intended for. The work by Titian that Rubens has copied here um, is, was a, a particular courtesan who Titian knew. He depicted her three or four times, included her in various portraits, but there's no doubt that the portrait itself was a private one. And similarly here, um, Rubens has copied Titian and then he later emulates and appropriates aspects of this work for um, his own study of his wife. But again, from flesh to fashion, degrees and states of undress. Um, we, we can say a lot about um, what these works were intended for, their intended audiences. And nine times, if it's not a Venus or um, a, an Eve, it's usually for private um, consumption. Not everything these artists made were intended for the public. And then whipping through Rembrandt in one minute um, is just to say <laughs> he too was engaged with Titian as Rubens was. And in fact, I mean, it's really interesting to think of these artists, how they copied other artists, how they, they were alive to the past, to the history of art, and that's how they learned and studied and trained. And that pedagogy I find absolutely fascinating. So in the catalog for the show, you can read about how Rembrandt was um, likely inspired by a painting by Titian called Flora in order to deliver this um, beautiful uh, vision of the goddess as well. And again, states of dress and undress. Here we have a very relaxed, casual chemise. Um, and of course, just to flick ahead, this was going to be my last <laughs> thing for the show. Um, you know, states of fashion, and here we have our, our women depicting women and thinking about the vibrancy of contemporary dress and the now. And so we've talked a lot in this, or I've talked a lot in this session about uses of the antique and an indicator of that kind of level of appropriation. There's my timer. Um, uh, but something else really crucial is the painting of the now. And the further you go along in the exhibition, the more that becomes apparent. So even with our Rococo works, I mean, the, the present and contemporary fashion um, is fully on display. And aspects of dress up that I wanted to talk about, because dress up and playing um, those kinds of games are not just for children, and they're, they're apparent in a new number of the works in the show. Um, and, you know, with 17th century Dutch art, for example, and that shift into a very secular kind of zone, you see all kinds of fashion on display, and art historians have a great time picking out which of the costumes are um, anachronisms and which are present day, and usually it's this colorful and creative amalgamation of both. So, to clue up, I mean, I didn't even talk, get to the 19th century, but I will next week, because when we talk about things, that's gonna be a really important um, aspect of what we do. Um, but just to say, I hope you've seen today that fashion and costume is a really important lens with which to look at these works, and it opens up questions that we don't get to address if all we're thinking about is who painted something.